Coming up on Network Africa today. Provisional results by the opposition candidate Basiri Faye in a strong lead with about 53.7% over Madhu Ba, who has 36.2%. Togo adopts new constitution, moving the nation from presidential to parliamentary system. Plus, South Africa welcomes just passed UN resolution demanding immediate ceasefire in Gaza. To the program, I'm Anne Wawadu in Lagos. We we'll start with news in Senegal, where provisional results from the presidential election put Basiru Faye in a strong lead with about 53.7% of the votes, while Amadou Ba has 36.2%. His victory comes less than two weeks after he was released from jail. Mr. Faye has pledged to govern with humility and transparency in his first speech after Sunday's poll. Mr. Faye's main rival from the governing court. Malaysian Amadou Ba has already conceded defeat, setting the stage for the 44-year-old political newcomer to become the youngest president in the country's history. One of Mr. Faye's main priorities as president will be national reconciliation following three years of unrest and a political crisis in Senegal. He is also vowing to fight corruption at every level, rebuild institutions and tackle the cost of living crisis there. He thanked outgoing President Macky Sall for helping to conduct a successful poll. Though the Constitutional Council is yet to officially announce the final results, there is jubilation across the country. To other stories, lawmakers in Togo have adopted a new constitution where residents will no longer elect their president. The constitution was introduced by members of the ruling party late on Monday, transitioning the country from a presidential to parliamentary system. One of the main changes brought by the new constitution is that lawmakers will elect the president of the republic for a single six-year term. The position of president of the Council of Ministers was also introduced. Its whole will have full authority and power to manage the affairs of the government. The president of the Council of Ministers will either be the leader of the party which secures the majority during the legislative elections or the leader of the winning coalition of parties. The country's opposition, which boycotted the last legislative elections in 2018 and recently denounced irregularities in the electoral census, is poorly represented in the National Assembly. It has not yet been determined when this change will come into force. The United Nations is calling for urgent international support to help avert a humanitarian crisis in Mali and the Sahel UNHCR's Assistance High Commissioner for Protection, Ruven Menkiduela, during a visit to Mali, noted the stark realities faced by refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons and the stateless individuals, emphasizing the need for enhanced solidarity and assistance. Mali is currently hosting over 66,500 refugees while grappling with 354,000 IDPs, highlighting the significant challenge of forced displacement across borders and within its territory. Recent movements across the Sahel region underscore the fluidity and the complexity of the crisis, with families fleeing violence and persecution, seeking safety and dignity under the increasingly strained condition. So I've just been visiting an IDP site where there's some over 200 families here. They've been here since 2019. I've been talking to the men, to the women, and to some, seen some of the children at play. The main thing from them is pretty clear. They want access to education for their children. They want some form of income, and they definitely want a solution to their situation. And we are here to work with the government and with all our partners to try and find that solution for them. Sudan is set to form a government of technocrats to run the affairs of the country until elections are held. Sudan's ruling sovereign council member, General Jabir Ibrahim, declared this while addressing military officers and other officials in the eastern city of Gedaref. According to state-owned Sudan news agency Suna, General Ibrahim called it a non-political transitional period in the country. He indicated that the armed forces will not enter any agreement with politicians. 
General Ibrahim's remarks are coming just days after another Sovereign Council member, Lieutenant General Yasir al atta said the army will not cede power to civilian groups until after elections are held in the country. Let's head to South Africa, where the Minister of International Relations, Naledi Pandora, has expressed satisfaction over the United Nations Security Council's recent call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza throughout the remainder of the holy month of Ramadan. And this marks a significant development, as it is the first time the Council will make such a call since the onset of the conflict in October, following several unsuccessful attempts. Ramadan commenced on March the 10th. It is scheduled to conclude on April the knife. Minister Pandor hailed this initiative as a positive step forward, signaling progress in the ongoing effort to promote peace and stability in the region. Uh, South Africa has uh, called for a ceasefire for many, many weeks, and we're very pleased that at last uh, the Security Council has agreed on a resolution uh, calling for a ceasefire for uh, a long-term period uh, during this month of Ramadan, but also uh, proposing that uh, work should begin toward a permanent uh, ceasefire. I think this is a welcome uh, resolution, and now the ball is in the court of the Security Council because they'll be tested as to their ability to ensure adherence to the resolution. But uh, on having... Uh, agreed a resolution, having tabled it and passed by the majority of the members, uh, this is certainly an encouraging step. Well, our visit to uh, the United States continues work that has uh, been started by President Ramaphosa to affirm uh, the very positive relationship between uh, South Africa and the United States of America and to continue to advocate for uh, a greater uh, economic partnership between the two countries, as well as continued participation of South Africa in the American Growth and Opportunities Act, uh, which allows uh, uh, for a preferential trade for a number of African countries, including South Africa. We had uh, indicated concern at some of the resolutions and legislative proposal uh, that were before the House of Representatives. And part of our mission is to engage uh, uh, political uh, office bearers uh, in the United States to uh, set out the position of South Africa on the long-term question. Still in South Africa, the Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee will be announcing its decision on the country's interest rates on Wednesday, following a series of meetings the committee has held this week. Governor Lasetcha Ngayogo has previously indicated that until inflation threats to four, retreats to 4.5% in a sustainable manner and settles there, the central bank will be unwilling to adjust its policy stance. According to economists, the Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee will maintain the repo rate at its current level. One is expecting to see that our central bank will leave our interest rates unchanged. And why we know that inflation is still elevated, and yes, it's not just a local problem, even internationally, inflation is still at high levels. But the most important thing when it comes to central bankers is that they don't want to lose credibility, meaning they don't want to start decreasing interest rates sooner, and then thereafter it happens or it pans out that inflation continues to be very stubborn because now that will force their hand again, making them to start increasing interest rates more rapidly. So they just want to be more convinced that in this fight against inflation, at least they've managed to win it. And also what is working to their advantage is that the concerns that we had earlier about the possible recessions are gradually fading away because we can see more economic data continues to point to the fact that economies continue to be resilient. We do not expect the Reserve Bank to hike the repo rate until further notice, if ever it will. To the contrary, 
it is foreseeable and predictable that there may be a possibility that towards the end of this year, not mid-year, towards the end of this year, the South African Reserve Bank may start cutting down the repo rate, provided that the major countries like the United States have also started doing so. Because the South African Reserve Bank usually takes its cue from the United States of America Federal Reserve. Away from South Africa, four people, including a police officer, have died in an explosion in a small hotel near a police station in Mandera, northeastern Kenya. Fifteen people were also injured in that incident. Two critical cases were flown into the capital, while others have been admitted at a hospital in Mandera. Investigators have blamed Al-Shabaab for this attack, saying the blast was caused by an improvised explosive device that had been planted at a hotel and was detonated as a crowd of people sat down to eat breakfast. The latest attack followed another one on Sunday in coastal Kenyan's Lamu County, where two police reservists were also killed. Now let's get more on this from Kenyan journalist Sarah Sambati, who is speaking to us from the capital, Nairobi. Hello, Sarah. Thank you very much for joining us on Network Africa. All right, let's talk about the first thing here, which is a situation right now in Mandera, especially with the injured. What is it looking like at the moment? Good, good evening. We understand that uh, the injured were around 20, and uh, five of them went through kind of a surgery, which, which they needed urgently. Uh, some of them have been lifted to Nairobi for further treatment. Four died on the spot, or other three died on the spot, and one succumbed to the injuries in the hospital. The area is uh, near the kenya somali border, uh, which is more porous in a way. But then uh, what's surprising is that Mandera is now having a kind of a lull from such attacks. Uh, whatever happened yesterday was uh, a surprise to the locals and some non-locals because uh, the, the, the county government and the, the national government in the area have been kind of trying, they have managed to contain the situation for that long time because uh, it has not happened since 2019 when uh, the two Cuban doctors were abducted from the same area. Uh, remember the, Q, the Cuban doctors are said to have been killed in uh, Somalia where they were, they were being held by al Shabaab to help them treatment with so many uh, patients they have. So as it turns now, there's, there's a lot of operation going on in Mandera and then the, the surrounding areas, in, in trying to get those people behind the attack. But we believe the, the, the bomb was set and uh, the, those behind the setting of the bomb were, had gone actually, it was detonated from a distance. So uh, we we have not seen any, any more of arrest, or kind of arrest from uh, from the police, uh, in as much as they are pursuing the attackers behind the, uh, the incident yesterday. So Cyrus, what you're saying is that no government or no suspect has been arrested, but what of the two police reservists that were killed the day before that attack? What is being done for security in that area? So far, there's no arrest has been made in connection with the attack yesterday. The, the attack in Mandera came a day after, after the, another, another attack had happened in Mandera, somewhere called Lamu, which is uh, the coastal region of uh, Kenya. It's also the borderline between Kenya and Somalia, where two uh, national police services were killed and one was injured. This was during an exchange of fire between uh, the national police service and uh, uh, national police reservists and then and the, 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 the kind of uh, the terrorists who were attacking the area during the attack the, there was a house which was burnt those are the, the, the signs that these are terrorists who are attacked the area then they stole some foodstuffs from homes here and there and before they left the place uh, we, they, remember lam has been also uh, another affected area in terms of uh, terrorism and uh, the government has been uh, pumping in terms of the more and more in terms of resources uh, police, uh, vehicles, uh, intelligence collection. But then uh, these terrorists actually, they sneak from uh, the Somalia border, they come to Kenya for attacks. Of course, they, they have an agenda, which is a terror related kind of, they want to, to declare the regional culprit area. But then uh, there's a lot of pressure also from the government side. Uh, we have had a lull in terms of attacks in the area. That's why it was, this was the latest, but uh, also, it had come, it came almost after a month. That's long enough to say because 
there was a time it used to happen frequently, but now because of persistent operations which are ongoing there, we can see there's a more of a stability or rather a stable situation in terms of security. Okay. But we hope that with the time coming ahead, we will have a kind of a stable situation and secure environment for the locals to be able to, to kind of make their living. Because lamb is, a, is more productive in terms of agriculture and because of the attacks which are frequently happening there, there's, there's a lot of fear. So this has affected in terms of production in so many ways and development at large. Thank All you so right. much for making this show. Yeah, thank you very much. Kenyan journalist Cyrus Mbati, thanks a lot for your time on Network Africa. And in just a moment after the break, Nigerian spies in South Africa hosts an event to honor outgoing Consul General tonight of Nigeria to South Africa. Please join us again. Welcome back. Ethiopia's largest commercial bank is reporting that it has recovered more than three quarter of the money it had lost after a technical glitch allowed clients to withdraw or transfer more money than they had in their accounts. In a press statement this morning, the head of Commercial Bank of Ethiopia, Abe Sano, said that more than $14 million was withdrawn for cash machines or transferred to other accounts during the incident that took place on March the 16th. According to Mr. Abe, more than $10 million has already been recovered. Initial reports by local media said the amount of money transacted during the glitch most made by university students could be as high as $14 million. According to the bank's chief, thousands of clients returned the money voluntarily. He added that those still withholding such monies could face criminal charges. UK-based London to Lagos solo driver Belumi Nubi has been involved in an accident. The solo trooper posted footage of her wrecked car, fondly called Olua Lumi, on her social media pages. A segment of the video caption, Say a Prayer for Me, shows Miss Nubi receiving care from medical personnel. A day after before this announcement, Belumi had announced her arrival in Liberia. However, it's still unclear where this accident occurred. Our thoughts and prayers are with her at this time. International French Day is one observed on March 20 every year, and it's observed within the international organization of La Francophonie's 77 member states to celebrate the French language and the culture. The day was created in 1988 and celebrates the signing of the Niamey Convention in Niger on March 20, 1970. But right here in Lagos, Nigeria, three countries spearheaded the celebrations, and that's France, Canada, and Switzerland. You know, when I, I speak to young Nigerians about their aspirations in traveling and working and maybe moving to Canada, just to underline that uh, perhaps learning uh, French uh, is not just a benefit in understanding Canada, it's a tool to possibly secure employment. So it's, um, you know, as, we, as I'm here in Lagos right now, in part to support uh, La Francophonie and the events around uh, this important week, it's one of the messages um, I try and underline to uh, Nigerians. Just, um, you have the benefit of being in West Africa, uh, Nigerians, as you and I both know, extremely industrious, extremely diligent, uh, studious. Uh, let's let's add maybe French language uh, to the list of uh, a professional, um, you know, uh, attributes uh, that Nigerians aspire to because it will open doors. I have no doubt. The theme of the summit is to create, to innovate, and to undertake in France. This and the lights the multiple opportunities and dynamism of the French-speaking world while encouraging creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship as levers for job for the youth. This summit will also enable this country to reflect on the issues and challenges facing the Francophonie today in a rapidly changing world. Here in Nigeria, we are working together with a number of educational and institutional partners to train more teachers, equip schools, and to create more modern and innovative learning environment 
promoting the development of real skills for the youth, for young Nigerians. 60% German speaking or 65% German speaking, 30% French speaking, 5% in the south of the country speaking Italian for bordering Italy, logically. And then, yes, a, a small zero point something percentage that speaks Romanche, a traditional language still spoken in certain hidden valleys and mountains in uh, East Switzerland, exactly. So it's embedded in our constitution. It's an official language. Uh, basically, you learn one of the three languages in school or two of the three languages in school, the main one. Romanche is really something traditional that we want to keep, to keep differences alive and not to stream, mainstream everything. Our world nowadays is a bit mass media, is mainstream. We want to cultivate those differences. And this is why we still have Romanche. And let's head back to South Africa. The Nigerian Spice recently hosted a grand event to honor His Excellency, Mr. Andrew Edie, who's the outgoing Consul General of Nigeria to South Africa. Attendees praised Mr. Edie for his dedication to promoting cultural exchange and facilitating opportunities for Nigerians living in South Africa. Mr. Edie has served as the Nigerian Consul General to South Africa for the past two years. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, captured the essence of this memorable occasion. It was a night filled with celebration and reflection as the Nigerian community in South Africa came together to bid farewell to Mr. Andrew Edi, who has served as the Consul General for the past several years. Mr. Edi expressed his gratitude for the warm reception he received during his tenure and highlighted the strong ties between Nigeria and South Africa. When I came out to and provided a special venue for students, everyone's trade, passports, express production for students. And then participants. Our officers have been to give a lot of four times this year to resolve this particular issue. There's no choice. We have to go again tomorrow. Find out our best. Okay, that's Attendees praised Mr. Edie for his dedication to promoting cultural exchange and facilitating opportunities for Nigerians living in South Africa. Uh, I want to appreciate him because he's a father to the Nigerian students in, uh, in South Africa, especially the passport policies whereby he said that um, it's a special window for Nigerian students. As far as you are a student in South Africa, when you apply for your passport, you'll be issued a passport immediately. What I will say is, I met a man with human character. I mean a humble man that has human feelings. Many shared fond memories of his leadership and commitment to serving the Nigerian community. He's, he's a man of integrity. That's what I like about his person, you know. He's, and, and a person of integrity wants to do things properly. I resonate with that, which is why I really enjoyed his tenure here. And you can see he's not only got integrity, he's got compassion. Those are all things I resonate with, you know. I mean, to the point where he can take his own personal money, even though he doesn't have a big budget, but he can take his own personal money and help Nigerians in distress. I mean, he's, that's going over and beyond. And that's the hallmark of someone who does his work well. You go over and beyond. We extend our best wishes to Mr. Andrew Edi as he embarks on the next chapter of his journey. And we look forward to witnessing the continued growth of Nigerian-South African relations. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channel Television News. With that, we draw the cuttings on this edition of Network Africa for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu.